Welcome, everybody. I've got 6.30 on the nose. Um, we might give people uh, just a couple minutes uh, to connect. On the screen at the moment, you see uh, the people that will be presenting today. So let's just give people a minute or two. Councillors Bradford and Councillor Fletcher, nice to see you. My name is Nicole Swern. I'll be facilitating the meeting today. And uh, as I said, I'll give people a minute or two uh, just to make sure that they're able to join um, and then we'll get started. Chantal, you wanna say something quickly just to make sure I can hear you all right? Hi, can you hear okay. me well? Okay. Yeah, perfect. It was so quiet there. I thought maybe we were the 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 system wasn't working. Okay. Great. Um, I will uh, start with the land acknowledgement, then I'll hand it over to the councillors for a few opening remarks, and then they'll throw it back to me. Um, uh, Councillor uh, Bradford, Councillor Fletcher to review the agenda um, with the public. We are here for a, a second community meeting for 1631 Queen Street East, a housing now site. And I've been honored to, um, I'm honored to have been uh, asked to do the land acknowledgement on behalf of Create TO and the City of Toronto. And um, it's our role as settler descendants and non Indigenous Canadians to offer our proper respect by giving this land acknowledgement. And we do so as allies and supporters of indigenous peoples on Turtle Island. And my good friend and colleague, um, Bob Goulet say it's always, says, it's always important to put myself into that land acknowledgement. Um, so first of all, the, the lands uh, we're talking about today at 1631 Queen Street East are covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. I'm a Scarborough baby, um, a child of immigrants. My mom uh, is here from East Germany and my, uh, on the other side of my family, my grandfather came from the Ukraine. And when I say this acknowledgement, it helps me and reminds all of us to be mindful of the treaties that are still in place um, and the peoples that lived here long before us. 1631 uh, Queen Street East is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And we know today that Toronto is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. I encourage you, wherever you are, to learn about and acknowledge the traditional territory you're in, get to know more about the treaties signed in that, in that territory, and get to know the peoples who are an important part of the area. I'd also like to emphasize how important it is to give Indigenous communities space for healing and to give support through allyship in their call for justice. And with that, I will hand it over to our esteemed elected officials. Councillor Bradford, do you want to start us off or throw it to Councillor Fletcher? Up to you. Why don't we start with Councillor Fletcher? My, my colleague to the start. West. I think we should start with you, but you can, uh, I just want to say hi to everybody. And uh, this is a great project in Councillor Bradford's ward, uh, but the big zone that everybody's been notified about this project goes way over into my ward where there's many residents who are probably interested. So I'm hoping that there's people online from Ward 14 and that you're going to get a really great update today. And I just want to thank Councillor Bradford for his leadership on this housing now site. Thank you. Thanks so much, Councillor. Councillor Bradford. Well, and I would say uh, the same over to you, Councillor Fletcher. It's it's been a pleasure of working with you on a on a number of big files over the term here, two and a half years in. And uh, for those uh, who have been following the housing file, you know that uh, there's a housing now site uh, just to the west in Councillor Fletcher's. Ward and uh, she's done a great job with that as well, and and we're hoping to replicate that success here. 
and that what that's what tonight's all about. So uh, thanks to everyone for for tuning in. Seventy seven folks on the line and climbing. So that's a great turnout. Uh, for those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Brad Bradford. I'm, I'm your city councillor here in beautiful beaches, East York. Uh, we start at Coxwell and we go all the way east to Vic Park from the water up to sunrise. So that's a little bit of the boundaries. But, you know, I think the point is well taken. These are neighbourhoods. Uh, it's really not about the ward boundaries. It's the community. And so uh, that's what we're here talking about tonight. And it's, uh, you know, as we heard there, it, it's hard to believe that this public consultation actually kicked off last year in December. Uh, I think a lot has changed in the world uh, in many respects, and at the same time, not a whole lot. Uh, you know, I'm hopeful that we can get back to seeing each other and having these conversations in person uh, in short order as soon as it's safe to do so. Um, I guess tonight I'll start with the same message that, you know, that I had for everyone back in December. Uh, I am incredibly excited about this project, uh, and we should be excited about what we're going to build here uh, together. There's no doubt that we have a desperate need for affordable housing in the city. Uh, and certainly here in our community, we're going to hear tonight that this site is going to do uh, some heavy lifting and contribute to nearly 300 new units of housing for people with half of those being affordable rental units. Uh, and, and, you know, you think about who's moving in. Well, it's the kind of people who have spent the last 18 months uh, that we've been talking about frontline healthcare workers and hospitals, teachers, TTC operators. Um, those folks working in the essential sectors, keeping our lives running while we've been battling this global pandemic. Um, we'll hear more about the Housing Now program, but that's that's really the slice of the city uh, in which these units will be uh, geared towards. So, when we first came out with the Housing Now program last year, you know, I was really proud of of the city uh, taking tangible steps to actually deliver on our commitments to housing. Uh, but I was actually also a little bit disappointed that we hadn't landed on a site uh, here in Beaches East York. And now with the second tranche, uh, we have a real marquee site, a gateway to uh, to part of the East End here on Queen Street, uh, and it will be a landmark. And I want to thank the folks in the community who have been so engaged on this file, uh, Greater Beach Neighborhood Association and others. Uh, you know, we always have a few hot files in the inbox, whether we're talking Woodbine Beach or talking modular housing in East York or small businesses. There's always a, a few hot files. Uh, but this is definitely one of them. Um, and for the most part, the feedback that we've received has been tremendously productive and constructive as uh, majority of the folks in the community are. Um, I will say, though, <laughs> you know, there, I, I have been a little concerned about some of the misinformation around this proposal, uh, which I'm hoping that we can clear up through tonight's discussion, set the record straight for folks, provide that clarity. Uh, you know, I apologize if that wasn't there before. Uh, I've seen the posters, skyscrapers in the beach. I've seen the uh, the material in Beach Metro. So appreciate uh, appreciate people engaging. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna set the record straight for folks tonight. And and to be very clear, this is a city owned site, and the city or our agency of Create TO is the one making the planning application here. So it's it's not a private developer. This is the city making a planning application on a city site, and there's going to be a mix of affordable and market housing. And we do that here in Toronto because the market housing helps pay for the affordable units. So there's a range of affordability needs in Toronto. And, and you know, I think no one project can address address them all, which is why we have a housing continuum. And, uh, you know, this site is about affordable rental housing, people with fairly average middle incomes here in Toronto. Uh, and there are other sites that fulfill a wide variety of other needs. Um, you know, here, as I mentioned, we, we have a new supportive housing project near Woodbine and O'Connor. That's going to house 59 folks uh, ex exiting chronic homelessness, and it's extremely important. They're going to have wraparound 24-7 supports there. Um, at, at Coxwell and Girard, uh, we're going to have another site with affordable units and, and many, many others. So to be very clear, one, one more time, we're here to share information. We're here to get your feedback about this proposal as a planning application. Uh, like any development application, city planning must and does take the community's feedback very seriously. Um, and any community member who's who's been involved in the consultation process uh, for a rezoning application knows that uh, that that feedback shapes these applications. So I think, in my view, coming from city planning before I ran for office, uh, the best developments and projects in Toronto have been shaped by very thoughtful feedback from the surrounding community. And I know that a community as engaged as ours and as passionate as ours is going to look at this proposal and provide us with that meaningful impact to shape it so that we can have a great project. After the meeting, uh, the city planning department is going to lead through 
a review of the proposal, taking into consideration all the points of feedback, um, as well as you know the dozen other commenting partners and divisions that play a role in this to address issues like transportation and parking and water and sewer and infrastructure and, and all the sort of things that we need to have in place to help our community grow. After that, CreateTO is gonna revise the proposal and make a resubmission to the city. So by no means is tonight the end of the process, uh, quite the contrary. Um, we are we are working through the process, but there's a lot of work left to do. And the other thing I wanna call out is how this project affects the Queen Street design guidelines and the precedent for the development area. I had a very good call with folks from the Greater Beach Neighborhood Association. We talked about that, staff joined us for that. You're gonna get the technical explanation from staff tonight, which I think is very important. But to give it to you in a sentence, this proposal does not undermine or set a negative precedent to development on Queen Street. And I know that that's very important for a lot of folks on the line. You were involved, gave a lot of your time and energy to shaping those guidelines and being a part of that. This proposal does not undermine that. And we'll see that the majority of the height is on Eastern Avenue. The application has actually been changed to reflect and respond to the concerns about the six story guideline on Queen. So you're gonna see that. And there's been a lot of work on this since the project was first launched as a, as a uh, conceptual level. So um, I'm gonna remind everyone of what I mentioned in our first meeting. Uh, the project is about that trade-off between density and affordable housing. And you know, again, the formula is very simple. Uh, the more units we have, the more affordable housing that we can afford to provide for people. And uh, you know, in a housing crisis and in a market like ours, and I think of my friends, you know, in, in their 30s that are struggling to to find places, that, folks who are younger, and also seniors who want to, you know, stay in the community. Uh, housing is a real challenge here in the city, and it compromises our future success if we can't take the steps now to address that, it's gonna be a lot harder down the road. So uh, we have to find the right balance. Uh, we need a reasonable and sustainable amount of density on this site, but we do need to bring housing and provide housing for people. So there's the planning framework we're gonna work, work through and, and work within. Uh, we want this to be a livable, welcoming community as it is today, um, but we will have to push in order to meet our affordable housing goals. And, and that's the world we're living in right now. I think change is always hard. Transformative change takes courage and conviction. I know that we share a lot of values on the need to provide that housing uh, and do it in a thoughtful way, um, but that we have to do it. So we're gonna support each other. We're gonna build a brighter future, not just for us who are here today, but for our neighbors who will join us in the future. And you know, I'll just close with a couple of things saying I'm grateful that you're here and participating. Uh, I wanna acknowledge First, uh, as we think about the geography in the context of this little corner of our ward and community, uh, we had a big announcement on Tuesday about the new live music venue, history, making history in the East End. Um, you know, it, it's been a long time coming, well predates my time in office, but, uh, you know, the site had planning approvals back in 2016 and 2019, they did the site plan. Um, this too is a positive thing, but you know we're going to have to manage that, uh, manage the impacts and the way that we think about the site. And there will be things to consider for our new neighbors who are moving in here as well. So that's that's important. We knew the venue was opening. It's been under construction for three years. <laughs> it doesn't fundamentally change anything about the opportunity to build housing on this site, but it does speak to the importance of making sure we have all of the infrastructure, design considerations, traffic management, all of that sort of stuff in place to make the project a success. Things like a daycare, other amenities, park space, urban realm. We're going to be talking about that tonight as well. And I have to thank the team uh, delivering this city planning staff, CreateTO, which is our city's real estate agency, the housing secretariat. Uh, we're in good hands with them. Um, I can objectively say there is a real top, top tier, top shelf team on this site uh, because it's so important. And uh, I'm grateful for them, uh, you know, being so engaged in this all the time and the meetings that they've had with me outside of, you know, our conversations tonight. They're putting in a lot of work. Uh, I know it's harder to do it virtually, but uh, we ha we really do have fantastic staff on this. And um, and I also want to acknowledge that uh, there's a, there's a team working on this with respect to the indigenous place keeping component of this project. We've had a number of meetings on that already with folks from the indigenous community. Uh, the area has a rich indigenous history and consultation with various groups, partners and organization is going to be a key component. It's something that we're going to celebrate and build and uh, and really have a deep acknowledgement to in, in this project here on the site. Um, I think in light of everything that we've heard over the last couple of weeks, um, and we think about the residential schools, we think about the 215 lives that were lost. Um, 
everyone must agree that uh, it couldn't be more important to incorporate and uh, acknowledge and celebrate that that rich Indigenous history that we have here on this site. So I'll leave the rest of the details to the Creatio team and, and Bob Goulis, who my gratitude for helping helping me listen and learn um, about the Indigenous history here. And uh, looking forward to hearing from everyone tonight on the line. Um, again, really excited about this project. Really appreciate your support and excited to do something very special here. Back over to you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'll do a quick uh, introduce myself and then introduce uh, some of the uh, other presenters here and I'll get them to raise their hand when I get to them. And then um, Matthew on our team will uh, have the agenda on screen. I'll review that and then we'll get into the presentation. So my name is Nicole. I'm here with my colleague, um, Matthew, and we work for Sworn Inc. We are independent facilitators that work only for governments and public agencies. And we are not advocates for the outcomes of the projects we work on. We're really here to help facilitate constructive discussion among participants. And you would have met us um, back in December when we had the first of um, the two community meetings um, happening at this stage of the Housing Now project on this site. Uh, one of the things um, in our role is we take a lot of notes and we will document a summary um, of the feedback provided. We are also recording the session tonight and that recording will be available on the CreateTO website. It will not be edited in any way. We had some emails in advance of the meeting asking about that. No, it's the raw recording. The only thing we do is that we add uh, captions underneath to make it a little easier for uh, people to quickly get to the spot that they want. Um, and that's it. So the first part of the meeting will really be, uh, you heard the executive summary from Councillor Bradford. You'll get a more detailed um, review uh, by uh, the staff team. And uh, when that is complete, we have some questions for you and you may have some questions for the team. So what CreateTO and the city would most like to understand is what do you like about what you're seeing? And do you have any suggested refinements? And if you do, what are they? Of course, we always say, um, if those questions don't work for you, don't worry about it. Whatever you came to share um, is great. And uh, you might also have some questions for the project team. And um, we will work through a queue. And if at the end of the meeting tonight, and we can't get to everybody, um, we'll make sure that you've got the contact information. Mladen is the community planner here and all questions should be directed perfect to him. Um, so, actually, with that, I see Anna Lee um, briefly coming and going. Let me just uh, get you guys to quickly raise your hands and, and wave. So, Anna Lee and Mladen are here from the City of Toronto, and they're on the planning side. Uh, from CreateTO, uh, the fearless leader is Chantel. Great. And there are consultants here uh, working with CreateTO and the City. So, we've got Sony and Audrey and Stephen, who will be part of the presenting tonight. All right, wave there. Great. And then on the Indigenous placekeeping front, we have Matthew and Bob. Great. Okay, so you've got everybody there and uh, you should also see Matthew Wheatley who is uh, part of the facilitation team. If you have any issues, um, uh, many of you may have already been connecting with him ahead of, ahead of this meeting. Um, so maybe Matthew is a good time. I'll just show people, uh, walk people through the agenda and then I'll hand it over to Anna Lee to get started. So as the councillor said, um, the team has been working to make changes and refinements to the proposal for Queen East for this site um, since the community meeting back in December. We will uh, get briefed with an overview of those refinements to the development proposal, as well as um, information related to the placekeeping opportunity on Kishko Lane, Indigenous placekeeping opportunity. Then we'll have discussion, questions, and uh, wrap up around 8.25 and, and uh, adjourn around 8.30. So, so that's the plan. Um, at uh, the end of the presentation, all of the participants will be promoted to panelists. At that point, you'll be in control of your own camera and your own mic. We will leave those controls in your hands. The only reason our team would interfere is if there's some noise in the background and you're not aware that you're you're muted, uh, you're not muted if it's interrupting anybody. But other than that, we really um, we really leave it up to you to manage your own participation and we'll try to get to as many people as possible. Um, I always say the shorter your questions, the shorter the answers, the shorter the comments, the more people we'll get to. But in any case, we'll see how the, how the uh, presentation unfolds. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Um, Annalie, 
if anything happens mid presentation due to um, unreliable technology, Maladin, give me a thumbs up that you're ready to jump in. Good job. So, I hope not. I hope not, good. Nicole. I think I've worked it out. Okay, good. Annalie, over to you. And even if I, okay. So thank you, Nicole. I'll just uh, reiterate a bit about what we're going to talk about in tonight's presentation. I do believe my camera's probably frozen, but I can see the presentation here. So we're just going to do a little bit of a uh, recap of the Housing Now program and talk about the context and planning framework. Um, but we're gonna do so in a way that brings the Indigenous placekeeping up front. So we will do that right after the context and planning framework. Chantel and Sunny will deliver the project update um, and the information on the revised development proposal, and then we'll talk about next steps. So about housing now. Uh, as Councillor Bradford noted, there have been a number of announcements citywide about uh, identifying city-owned sites for the Housing Now initiative. Uh, you'll see the sites are located all over the city from uh, Etobicoke to Scarborough, North York, Midtown, Downtown, and here right in the beach. And uh, what we do as we look at every single one of these sites, uh, wh wherever they may be, is we look at the urgent need for new affordable housing and how the Housing Now initiative can deliver on that need as directed by council in a manner that is appropriate for the local planning context. And I hope that you hear from Maladin tonight how we've managed to do that here in the proposal that is in front of you for your feedback. Housing now is part of a spectrum of housing affordabilities. And that is shown here on the screen, going from emergency shelters all the way to market home ownership. You'll see the boxes on the screen that are highlighted are the types of housing tenure and affordability that are the focus of the Housing Now initiative. You have affordable rental housing, market rental housing, and where sites are large enough and can handle the density and multiple buildings, we also bring in affordable uh, market home ownership. So today we're looking at a project that really deals with new affordable rental housing and new market rental housing provided in a single building located at 1631 Queen Street with frontage also on Eastern Avenue. We want to really take some time to talk a little bit more again about what Council Bradford spoke to, which is uh, how affordable rent is going to help people who are living and working in the city and who are critical to making sure the city works. So I think as, as, the, as the councillor noted, we wouldn't have got through COVID without the people working on the front lines, either from healthcare or in the grocery store or looking after our children uh, who have put themselves out there and kept our city running. And it is these individuals who are also having challenges related to affording uh, housing in the city of Toronto. So here you have some avatars, uh, images of people who are making very, um, very average incomes in the city of Toronto from early childhood educators to retired people who live in communities across the city, of course, construction laborers and licensed practical nurses. And based on the average asking rents in the city of Toronto today, these people are spending up to 83% of their income on housing to get the housing of the type and size they need to support their households. So that is what Housing Now is seeking to address. I'm going to pass it on to Maladin now, who is going to speak about the planning context and planning framework. Thank you, Annalie. I'm gonna start off with the context. So this is a map showing the neighborhood context. As you can see, our city is located just east of Coxwell Avenue and faces both Queen Street as well as Eastern Avenue. East of the site, we have the, the Beaches Cinema, and just south of our site, across Eastern Avenue, we have the Woodbine Park and a large TPA lot. So if you can go up just one slide. Okay, thank you. Southwest of our site, we have the water sewage treatment plant, and along Queen Street, we generally have a mix of uses and buildings that are generally between two and six stories in height. And north of Queen Street, we have primarily low-rise residential buildings. This is our site. Currently, the site includes the Beaches Employment and Social Services Center and the Coxville Early Learning and Childcare Center in the existing building along Queen Street. At the back of the building, we have a service parking lot that backs onto Eastern Avenue. 
The site also includes Kichigo Lane, which is currently which currently functions as a through block connection for vehicles, as few parking spaces as well. The site normally doesn't include the Harvey's restaurant property, which is why it has somewhat of an unusual V shape to it. I should also mention that the, the dotted line area of the map is technically part of the adjacent property at 1080 Eastern Avenue, but it is included in this proposal as is, as it's uh, proposed to be used as an extension of the garage level and for a driveway and drop-off area for the proposed child care center on the ground level. There are a couple of pictures illustrating the nature of Queen Street. As many of you know, Queen Street serves as a main street for the neighborhood. These buildings are generally two to six stories in height and have commercial uses on the ground level. Due to this function as a main street, it attracts a lot of pedestrian activity. It's also serviced by a streetcar line. And here are a couple pictures of Eastern Avenue. Both Queen Street and Eastern Avenue are considered major streets in the official plan, but they function very differently. Compared to Queen Street, Eastern Avenue has less consistency in, in the uses and types of buildings. It's a wider street than Queen Street, and it caters more towards vehicles than pedestrians. In many ways, Eastern Avenue functions as sort of a, a service street for the buildings that face Queen Street. And this slide just shows the recent development activity in the neighborhood. West of our site across Coxville Avenue is the Don Somerville uh, proposal that was approved by council last year. It includes a 17 story building at its tallest point with a mix of social, affordable and market housing on the site. Across the street at 1602 and then also at 1624 Queen Street, we have a pair of six story buildings with retail and ground level, which were approved in the last few years. Northeast of our site at 1684 Queen Street, we have the Murphy's Law Proposal, another six story building, which is currently being reviewed by the city. In terms of the planning framework, the most important document the city has is the official plan. It provides overarching policies on how and where the city is expected to grow. Within the OP, the three main maps that apply to this site the first being the urban structure map. The urban structure map policies tell us where to focus growth and intensification and which areas we should protect from growth. This lot is located on a designated avenue in the urban structure map, which means that given the infrastructure along avenues, growth is anticipated to occur. However, each avenue is different and as such, not all development along the avenues is supposed to look the same. The second important official plan map is the land use map. The land use map provides general policies on how this growth is expected to look like. Our site is located within a mixed use area, which permits a broad range of uses and types of buildings, as long as they're compatible. The mixed use areas policies don't provide direction on the maximum height or number of stories, but generally buildings are supposed to fit within the existing context in terms of heights and types of buildings, and are supposed to limit their impact on surrounding buildings and public spaces. Another important document in the planning framework for this particular site is the Queen Street East Urban Design Guidelines. These guidelines were created about 10 years ago to guide development along Queen Street between Coxville Avenue and Nursewood Road. There are three different precincts within these guidelines, and our site is located within the Woodbine Beach Precinct. The intent of the guidelines is to reinforce the character of the beach's neighborhoods by keeping the maximum heights to four stories, and in some cases, when the lots are large enough, up to six stories. For the six story buildings, the front main wall along Queen Street must be a maximum of four stories or 12.5 meters. Anything above these four stories must be within an imaginary 45 degree angle plane, which is shown in the, the red in this uh, picture over here. But these are not just design guidelines because elements of the guidelines have been incorporated into the official plan policy, which brings me to the third most important official plan map, which is the site and area specific policy 466 map. Policies within this map are specific to this neighborhood and are intended to provide more refined and specific direction on the scale and size of buildings along Queen Street. In this policy, building heights are intended to be limited to six stories the front main wall 
height of 12.5 meters along Queen Street. While these policies are part of the official plan, are therefore fairly strong policies, they are permitted to be amended if the intent of these policies can still be maintained. During the last few months, we received lots of comments and questions asking us why we think the site is suitable for an official plan amendment, and if approved, will it set a precedent for the rest of Green Street? That's a very good question to ask, but I believe there are three main reasons why this site is unique within the Queen Street East Urban Design Guidelines study area, while it may be suitable for an official plan of amendment without setting a precedent for the rest of Queen Street. First of all, the lot depth. There are over 350 properties within the Design Guidelines study area, and most of them range uh, between 30 and 50 meters in depth measured from Queen Street to the back of the property line. This site it's a lot depth of around 80 meters, which makes it the deepest lot in the entire design guideline study area. Secondly, it fronts onto two major streets, one obviously being Queen Street, where we want to limit the height to six stories, and the other being Eastern Avenue, which doesn't have the same sort of characteristics as Queen Street. And lastly, the property doesn't back onto low rise residential buildings. Most of the properties in the study area directly back onto low rise residential buildings, and or there's just a laneway between them. In this case, the property backs onto Eastern Avenue, so we don't have to worry about transitioning to the low rise buildings and privacy and overlook concerns that are associated with such developments that are in close proximity to these low rise residential buildings. So since this is one of the only sites in the entire Queen Street East design guidelines study area that has these characteristics, I believe that we have, um, we, if we design the building correctly, find the right balance between maintaining six stories on Queen Street and adding density and height only in the portion of the property facing Eastern Avenue will not set a precedent for the rest of the neighborhood. In reviewing this proposal, we're also applying a few guiding principles. Obviously, we want to propose, um, we want the proposal to meet the intent of the design guidelines and the official plan policies. What we mean by this, and I just mentioned this, is that we want to, we want the portion on Queen Street to be clearly and concisely six stories in height any sort of additional density and height above that must be along Eastern Avenue. Also want a comfortable and attractive and high quality pedestrian realm along Queen Street, with enough space for trees, furniture, and uses along Queen Street that animate the street. Given the history of this site and the council direction, indigenous engagement and placekeeping on Kichigo Lane is another important guiding principle. And the fact that it's a large site and city owned, We'll see this as an opportunity to expand the early learning and childcare center and explore opportunities to include other community spaces in the building. And lastly, we want to create a family friendly building with the appropriate amount of multi bedroom units with appropriate sizes and also a family friendly and many spaces within the building in order to take advantage of the location and the expansion of the early learning and childcare center. This is just a map showing the existing zoning bylaws on the site. Currently it's zoned MCR, uh, mixed use commercial residential, it allows for a variety of different types of units, including um, residential, community services, retail and office uses. The maximum density in the site is 2.0, two times the area of the lot. The maximum height that's currently permitted of 12 meters. And here's just a flow chart for the application review process. Even before the first step, in the case of this Housing Now project, we had an initial concept presented to the community in December. So we were able to get feedback and staff were able to provide comments to create TO who had reviewed this feedback and comments. The application that was submitted earlier, a couple weeks ago, represents an already revised version of the proposal that, that responds to some community and staff feedback. This revised proposal has been circulated to various city divisions and other agencies for review and comment. And we're also here to receive the community's feedback on this latest revised proposal. CreateTO will take the comments from the city and the feedback received at tonight's meeting and further revise the proposal, then resubmit to the city in the coming weeks to try to address these comments. After this second review, we're planning on submitting a report to the Planning and Growth Committee in September with our final recommendations. The Planning and Growth uh, Committee meeting is considered a statutory public meeting, so you can sign up and speak at the meeting if you wish. But I just want to stress that even though this is the second community meeting, we're still fairly early in the process. 
We still haven't made a decision. City planning is still reviewing the proposal and there's still time, time to write comments. I mentioned we had the kickoff conversation meeting last December. Here are the, the main comments that we heard at that meeting and since then. So lots of support for affordable, affordable housing on the site. There also lots of concern that we would be deviating away from the design guidelines and it would be setting a precedent for future development along Queen Street. There's also lots of support for Kichigo Lane Indigenous engagement and placekeeping on the site. And also lots of support for the expansion of the early learning and childcare space. There was some support for the retail uses on the ground level. There's also some concern that they would end up being vacant in the long run. And lastly, there was concern with the cumulative impact of the neighborhood of all the development in the area, specifically regarding, regarding the transit and the transportation issues. And this is just a slide that notes uh, what informs the city's decision-making process on an application. There are many things we consider prior to making our final recommendation. Namely, we look at the planning policy framework for the site. We do a technical review by city staff. We look at past decisions and council directions. We also consider community feedback and comments. Community consultation is one component in our decision-making process, but it's a very important component. That's the reason why we're here today. And I'll pass it off to Chantel. Thank you very much, Imadi. So with every housing now file, we look to achieve a balance of key affordable housing criteria as well as broader site specific objectives. So for this site, the current estimated unit yield in the de development concept is 279 residential units. Our market offering will target the inclusion of 50% of the units as affordable rental units, uh, but at a minimum one third of those, of those rental units will be required to be affordable rental. We'll also be ensuring that the new development is compatible with its surrounding context and the character of Queen Street East, as Maladin pointed out. And also delivering enhanced accessibility criteria and meeting council direction, uh, which is 20% of all the affordable rental units will be designed as accessible. 15% of all the market units will be designed as accessible and all common areas will be designed to be fully barrier free. The broader objectives for this project include the incorporation of Indigenous placekeeping along Kishigo Lane as a publicly accessible open space that will celebrate the histories, culture, and the world views of Indigenous peoples. Uh, we're also ensuring that we are conducting meaningful and respectful engagement with the community, with the Indigenous communities, and with the residents of our TCHC neighbours at 1080 Eastern Avenue. Uh, the site obviously will also incorporate a larger child care center, as Melada noted, with capacity for 62 children. And the design will also seek to enhance the public realm along the three frontages of the property on Queen Street, Eastern, and of course, on Gishigo Lane. So the delivery of Housing Now projects is essentially divided in four uh, st stages. We are currently at the start of stage two. So last December, we completed our first round of community engagement, and that included a community meeting, a tenant meeting with the residents of 1080 Eastern Avenue and the design review panel. Since then, we've continued to receive and to listen to the community's feedback and worked very closely with our city colleagues to continue to revise and improve the design concept, which you'll see later today. Uh, we've also completed two Indigenous sharing meetings that are helping to shape and advance the preliminary design for Gishiko Lane. As Maladin noted as well, our first OPA and zoning bylaw submission went into the city on June 1st. Our second submission is anticipated next month, and that will reflect the feedback that we received tonight and the feedback that we received from our ongoing conversations with the TCHD tenants and in the Indigenous communities. The proposed official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment will go to city council for approval in stage three, at which point we will also be procuring a development partner through an open competition. In stage four, that selected development partner will lead the work through permitting, construction, occupancy, and will ultimately manage and operate the building for the lease term. There's also gonna be additional opportunities for community engagement and, and another design review panel uh, in stage four. As you can see from this graphic, the Indigenous engagement activities 
for to inform the design of Nishigo Lane are happening separately and similarly will continue in phase four. And these conversations are to help ensure that the development partner will successfully deliver the vision for Gishigo Lane. So with that, I'll pass it on to Bob and Matthew, who will speak more about the conversations and activities that have taken place since December and provide an update on how those have shaped the concept for Gishigo Lane. Chimigwet, Chantel, uh, welcome everybody. Bonjour, Nigwe, Mangana, Dr. Jacquette, and Dijnikos. It's my pleasure to be here with you. My name is Bob Goulet. I'm from Nipissing First Nation and own a little company called Nipissing Consulting, specializing in uh, doing this kind of engagement work with First Nations, Metis, and Inuit communities. First thing I'm going to say is happy Pride, wishing you all a uh, happy Pride Month. But also, uh, it's, it's also meaningful that it's National Indigenous History Month. So I urge each and every one of you to commit to lifelong learning about the truths surrounding Indigenous history, the history of Canada, residential schools, and not the 850 or the 215, but we're talking about thousands of children that did not return from residential schools. So get to learn more about that. It's also a great opportunity to rediscover the rich and beautiful living culture of First Nations and Métis and Inuit people. We've been talking about Indigenous placekeeping, and uh, that might be a, a term that might be a bit elusive for, uh, for some people to, uh, to understand. Placekeeping is an approach uh, that's designed centered around Indigenous knowledge, something I call Nishinaabe Odzwin, our way of being, our way of knowing. And it also incorporates those Indigenous design concepts that are you know, part of our symbolism, part of our cosmology, our teachings and our understanding. It recognizes the spirit of creation all around us and considers the place now and into the future in our responsibilities on the land. So it's really great that Kijigo Lane is going to be the city's newest green space, a, a small green space that is reflective of that indigenous culture and indigenous way of knowing. It's named after, as Chantal mentioned, uh, a, an 18th century Michisagi Nishinaabe family, uh, and apparently the gentleman uh, known as Kijigo, which is our, our word for from the sky. That's where that name comes from. Um, that uh, particular person, uh, Kijigo, helped a lot of the people around the uh, territory uh, as they settled in and in supporting them around, uh, uh, around the Don River Valley. Um, so it's really great that we're able to honor that particular family. Some of the input we heard from the last Sharon meeting was the space needs to be reflective of that Indigenous history and culture and truths of, uh, of our history and our, and our culture, including the Michisagi and the Kijigo family. That the space needs to be welcoming, that uh, we do that through the gateways or drawing people off of Eastern Avenue or drawing people off of uh, the streetscapes at, on Queen Street. Um, it's also need to consider places for ceremony. Ceremony is incredibly important for First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. So you know, this is a smaller space, so it'd be great to have smaller size, scalable family ceremonies where they can share food and share you know, their reflections on the land and the water. Uh, it's important to, to maximize as best we can in the urban environment natural elements and see those connections to uh, to Woodbine Park and other Indigenous places across the territory. So I know it's been a pleasure uh, for myself to host those sessions held in December and November, or sorry, uh, in March. I do want to invite First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people to come out to our next community sharing meeting taking place on Tuesday, uh, June 29th at 6.30. And that conversation is exclusively for those community members because we want to offer them a chance to hear their voice in our way. I want to introduce you to our principal designer on Indigenous placekeeping, a wonderful uh, gentleman uh, from uh, Two Row Architects. Uh, Two Row uh, does a lot of, uh, of uh, really great work in uh, um, in this kind of work. And Matthew Hickey is joining us from Two uh, Row Architects. Two Row is an Indigenous firm there from uh, Six Nations of the Grand River, representing that Haudenosaunee worldview. But uh, they've done a lot of great work across the territory and across Canada. So I'm going to turn it over to Matthew Hickey. Yeah, hey, Bob. So I just wanted to walk uh, everyone through some of the uh, four kind of key aspects that we're looking at uh, now for this project. The first one being some key design aspects that have risen to the top in our conversations with our Indigenous community. 
One of those is obviously uh, making sure that we're keeping place for the Gajigo family histories and making sure that we're honoring the history of this family on the laneway and in the laneway and how we're thinking about it. Uh, the other one that is really important to us as well is the reference to the buried Smalls Creek. As everyone knows, Toronto has a rich history of a lot of creeks and rivers that have been covered over. And this is this is a time and place where we can start to honor uh, the lost rivers of Toronto. Also, we want to do is connect with nature, and this can be done throughout the way that we're planting. Uh, as Bob has said, we also want to look at places for gatherings, small gatherings, places for ceremony, whether it be sharing food or a smaller gathering for people. Uh, indigenous plantings is going to be very important to this site as well. And some key other some other key aspects are, are about directionality. How can we honor the movement of the sun, the movement of celestial bodies? How can we relate to the larger world around us? And then also a very important one is for places for community. We have a, a few little uh, kind of barriers with the laneway, and this has been known since day one. Uh, this this image here on the left shows you all of the underground services that occur in this lane, which makes it a little tricky to build a park on it. But we think that we found a way to do that, and we'll show that in the next few slides. But we're really uh, interested in allowing access to underground services. Uh, we want to future proof the design intent of this laneway. This means if we put something down, it, it's not going to be ripped up in two months to fix a broken pipe or broken sewer main, but we're, we can do it in a way where we can disassemble the laneway and put it back just the way we, we left it. Uh, we want to allow for the maximum number of plantings on the site. So how can we maximize green space in, in, an, in a place where we are restricted by the underground services? We also need to allow for overground water flow. This is part of the drainage pattern from Queen Street to Eastern that's already existing. So we have to deal with that as well. And one of the ways that we're thinking about doing this is using pavers and not asphalt. Um, so along those lines, planters, plantings and pavers. Uh, these are some kind of precedent images that we can see uh, being put in this laneway or how this laneway could look. And you can see that these planters are placed on top of pavers, which could be easily moved or uh, uh, adjusted in order to service uh, the underground uh, the underground services. Uh, we also want to make sure that the planters are human scale so that people can use them to sit on and people be, they become uh, ways to create spaces within the laneway. Uh, we also are thinking about possible uh, patterns within the paving. Uh, you can see that very prominently in the middle image there, different ideas of how we can acknowledge the Kashigo family and other patterns that are indigenous. We also want to create planters that have a significant soil volume. We don't want to just have uh, smaller plants and flowers in here. We want to be able to possibly plant larger trees or mid-side trees so that we can create a space that feels more like a park space. Now, we also want to make sure that we are planting and using plantings that are reflective of the Mississauga culture. The last thing in, that I'm going to speak about today is the overall narrative, and this is really important for us to to get right for this uh, indicative design. You can see the and this axonometric here. You can see the the language on the top left, and it looks like the kind of uh, leaf shape or canoe shaped planters. Uh, the, there's seven of those planters. Uh, they all have a high amount of soil volume, and they're really meant to be reflective and to be able to tell the story of the Kishigo family in their design. Um, we're also looking at restricting vehicular access to this laneway, meaning that it's a place for people to be able to walk through, be a safe place for people to be able to walk through and to sit. And also people on bikes would likely want to dismount and walk through. Um, the, the arrangement of the planters are also going to create small spaces to, to gather and to be able to sit and talk to each other. And the planters are also meant to signify that this space is publicly accessible, open only for pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, again, as I mentioned, the planters need to be movable if required so that we can uh, adjust them in order to to service any underground uh, services. And along with those, the pavers are should be removable as well. I should note as well, you can see that the pavers are going to continue throughout the entire site and not just start and stop at Kashigo Lane. It's really meant to tie the whole landscape and urban realm together. And the last thing I'm going to say is that the planters are we're looking at doing integrated lighting so we can make sure that the safe the spaces are are livable at nighttime as well. And back to you, Chantel.
Thank you so much, Matthew. So I'll start just with a summary of the of the revisions to the design concept. So to build upon what Malade noted earlier in, in this evening's presentation, the revisions uh, are a, a reflection of multiple design inputs, including the feedback received from the community from the TCHC tenants, the Indigenous sharing meetings, and the design review panel, among others. However, prior to our first submission, we continued to work with city planning, urban design, and other commenting divisions to carefully refine the design concept and ensure that we were uh, prioritizing design excellence while still aiming to deliver on the critically needed affordable housing units. So to briefly summarize the major revisions, we've included a reduction in height along Queen Street and the Queen Street portion of the building from eight stories down to six stories. And this is to ensure that we are protecting the Queen Street character. We've repositioned this density towards Eastern Avenue where the building height has increased from 17 stories to 18 stories. Uh, the child care center has shifted from the, from fronting along Queen Street originally towards the center of the site, and this allows for the child care space and its outdoor space to open toward Ishigo Lane. Uh, moving the child care center allowed us to expand the program area along Queen Street. East. So we are currently working with our city colleagues to explore the opportunity of including a community center along Queen Street. A decision on this matter has not been made at the moment. So the space is currently being designed to accommodate the potential for both retail or the community space. In response to feedback from the design review panel and city planning, we've increased the space beneath the east-west pedestrian connection that connects uh, the existing public laneway off of Coxwell to Kishigo Lane, which you'll see later in the, in the graphics. And we've also proposed a realignment of, the, of a portion of the underground utilities, which Matthew showed earlier um, on his previous slide, um, to improve the efficiency and the layouts of the Eastern Avenue portion of the building and to help us provide additional residential density there as well. And last but not least, we are proposing some landscape improvements to the portion of the adjacent 1080 Eastern Avenue site. And this is a reflection of feedback that we've received from the tenants of the building last December. And we'll be having a second tenant meeting later this month to speak specifically about the proposed improvements that you'll see on the landscape plan. So the revised development concept includes an estimate, an estimated total of 279 rental units. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the market offering will target the inclusion of 50% affordable rental units, but there will be a minimum requirement of providing 33% affordable units. The suite mix proposed is currently 4% studios, 55% one bedrooms, 31% two bedrooms, and 10% three bedrooms. Uh, the community or retail space at grade on Queen Street is 687 square meters uh, in size. And the development proposal includes one level of underground parking with 81 parking spaces and 280 bicycle parking spaces are proposed at grade um, inside the building and outside of the building and within a mezzanine level. And this includes both long-term and short-term bike parking spaces. So now I'll pass it over to Audrey and Sunny of SBN Architects, who will walk you through the revised development concept in a bit more detail. Thanks, Chantal. This is a side-by-side -side, uh, comparison showing the previous concept from the last community meeting on the left and the current concept submitted for the rezoning on the right. I'll just highlight the key landscape changes um, and then Sunny will walk you through the architectural changes later. Um, overall, we've added more trees and planting on the site, including along the edges next to the 1641 uh, Queen Street Harvey's property. And as Chantal mentioned earlier, we have also proposed some landscape improvements for 1080 Eastern Avenue, which is the TCHC property. And these improvements include new new uh, trees, a seating area, and potential community gardening areas. We've also reworked the streetscape design on both Queen and Eastern to respond to the building changes and provide for a better pedestrian experience. And the last key change is that we've relocated the outdoor child care space to wrap around the east corner of the south building massing. And this is to maximize the morning light as well as activate Kishigo Lane. This is a sketch. Um, of the site looking east along Queen Street. We have street trees in the planting beds next to the sidewalk. Um, compared to the last time, we've given more thought to varying the configurations of the seating 
in order to create more of a social space outside of this community slash retail space. And um, as you can see, we've also located bike racks close to the building entrance. This is a perspective sketch of the site looking west along Eastern Avenue. And uh, based on the feedback from the des design review panel, we've changed the planter next to the sidewalk to be at grade and widened the planter to provide more soil for the trees and the understory planting. And uh, with the increased setback from the property line and the new building overhang condition, there is an opportunity for covered bike parking and seating. As well, um, the blank building wall may also potentially be used for public art. This is a perspective looking east along the east-west breezeway. Um, compared to last meeting, we have widened the breezeway, providing more opportunity for public space with seating and stormwater planters. The outdoor daycare also wraps around the east corner of the laneway in the distance, activating this portion of our laneway as well, well as Akishiko Lane. Trees and planting are also proposed to screen our site in the Harvey's parking lot. Now I'll hand it over to Sunny to walk you through the architectural updates. Thanks, Audrey. Uh, we're just going to return to the, the rendered um, ground floor plan, and I'll just walk you through some of the uh, changes to the architectural uh, components of the building. Um, so one of the key changes that we made is we moved the two-story childcare space that was fronting on to, onto Queen Street uh, towards the middle of the block, um, and then added the two stories in that space. And what that really does is help to animate uh, that east-west through connection that connects the Kishiko Lane onto uh, Coxwell Avenue, uh, and it really creates a frontage on the west, north, uh, and the east side uh, fronting Kishigo Lane there. And of course, the, the the moving of the outdoor space as well associated with that. And as you can see, what it does is it really opens up that space for, for better lighting uh, and for a safer pedestrian connection. Uh, replacing the childcare space along Queen Street is the uh, community uh, and retail space. Um, and the, one of the things we've done to really improve the condition on the west side um, to help animate and to give a better space for the childcare space is we move the parking uh, garage entrance to the north, uh, and then we move the loading space uh, to the south. So the childcare space really gets presence uh, along that western elevation. Um, we've pushed in the ground floor um, of the frontage on Eastern Avenue uh, below the tower, and that really helps to open up uh, uh, more public space uh, along that frontage. Uh, we move the front entrance further to the east, closer to Kashiga Lane. Uh, this is just an aerial view uh, showing the development block. And what it really highlights is the unique uh, characteristic uh, of this block. Um, really uh, unique in, in that it fronts Queen Street, but also fronts uh, Eastern Avenue towards the south. Uh, and as you can see, towards the west of uh, our development site, uh, the Don Somerville development, which is also uh, creating a frontage along Queen Street East, but also creating development, uh, taller development that's fronting along Eastern Avenue. And what this allows uh, this entire block to kind of uh, do is reimagine and rethink uh, what Eastern Avenue is. Uh, really, it's right now it's characterized by as a vehicular uh, through fare, uh, but really want to look at continuing to urbanize uh, the edge and really change what Eastern Avenue can be. Uh, this is a site plan, rendered site plan. Um, so it really just shows kind of some, some of the key uh, setbacks uh, and the development uh, blocks. Uh, so just starting uh, towards the top of the page, uh, north at Queen Street, um, we're providing a four meter setback from the property line. So really an enhanced uh, pedestrian area in front of that community retail space. Uh, then the building steps up to four stories uh, and then it steps back again uh, up to five and six stories. Uh, and then located on the roof of that six story uh, is just the outdoor amenity space for the building. Uh, then a, a larger setback uh, back towards a 12 story portion of the building uh, that really fronts the east and west uh, through, through uh, block access. Uh, and then further setbacks uh, to the tower fronting onto Eastern Avenue, uh, and then additional setbacks towards the uh, mechanical penthouse. And then facing uh, Eastern Avenue, additional setbacks of uh, four meters, and of course the uh, podium to tower setback of three meters along Eastern Avenue and along uh, Gishigo Lane. Uh, I'm gonna walk you through a series of perspective views. Uh, to the left are uh, views of our previous concept, and then to the right are the revised concept views. 
Uh, this is a view along Queen, uh, Queen Street East looking west. Um, and then one of the key changes, of course, mentioned previously is that we're uh, the development block fronting Queen Street has been reduced from eight stories uh, down to six. Uh, and then some of that density has been deployed onto the top of the tower that fronts Eastern Avenue uh, to add an, an 18, st uh, 18 stories. And one of the key concepts what we've tried to do throughout the, uh, the development of this project is really uh, create a development that has three distinct blocks uh, and really allow those blocks to read based on their frontages. So a lower mid-rise fronting on Queen Street, uh, then a distinct 12-story uh, mid-rise fronting on the east and west uh, sides of the development, and then a taller building fronting on to Eastern Avenue. Um, so really trying to avoid uh, that contiguous uh, wedding cake uh, type of development uh, and really help to break up those distinct blocks. Again, on Queen Street, uh, looking east this time, um, height of the, of the Queen Street portion reduced down to six stories. Um, the three distinct blocks uh, stepping up towards the 18 stories fronting on Eastern Avenue. Uh, and then you can see at the top of the tower, we've added the mechanical penthouse. Uh, in the preliminary concept, we hadn't shown the, um, the mechanical penthouse uh, and that's been added and within the angular plane. Now, this is a view along Coxwell Avenue, looking east towards Kishigo Lane. Uh, so one of the key uh, recommendations from the design review panel was to really look at uh, widening uh, and making uh, taller the through connection uh, between the different blocks. Uh, so as you can see, we were able to widen it uh, and to increase its height, and it's uh, a lot better condition, providing more light uh, and views th uh, through the space uh, and making it generally a better experience for pedestrians. Uh, this is a view from Kishiga Lane looking west. Uh, again, the uh, increased size of the three block connection. Uh, and then, of course, looking uh, to the right um, of the revised development concept is the childcare space now fronting uh, that through block connection and uh, fronting Kishiga Lane. Uh, this is a view along walking along Queen Street on the south side of the street. And what this really gives, uh, gives us is a really uh, an indication of what uh, a pedestrian's experience would be like on the street uh, of, of the building. And you can see on the right-hand side, uh, the development that's been completed. So we're really uh, matching uh, that development block in terms of uh, height. Um, some of the things we're doing a little bit differently is setting back from the property line by four meters. So you can see that enhanced setback uh, along the street edge. Uh, we're not providing uh, protruding balconies, but recessed balconies uh, for the four stories fronting Queen Street. So really helping to enhance the uh, pedestrian zone uh, with that, and then stepping up to six stories. Uh, this is a view on the south side of Eastern Avenue looking north towards Gushigo Lane. Uh, and what this really highlights is the uh, four story podium uh, on Gushigo Lane and the Eastern Avenue. Again, with recessed balconies uh, and, a, and a three meter setback towards the tower. Uh, I'll just walk through some of the high level uh, revisions uh, and highlights from the development. Um, so mechanical penthouse set in within the angular plane, 18, uh, an additional floor added uh, to make the development 18 stories, uh, but that floor has been set back to fit within the angular plane. Again, breaking up the massing uh, of the different development blocks to help to reduce the, the scale of the, the building. Four, store, uh, four meter setback along Queen Street, um, reducing the height of the block fronting Queen Street from eight stories to six stories. Um, and then as Audrey mentioned, adding trees and plantings to screen the Harvey site uh, along Kishigo uh, Lane. And then the outdoor amenities space uh, for the development located on the seventh floor. And then this is a view looking at the development at Eastern Avenue. Uh, so some of the highlights, uh, the four-story podium uh, where the tower sits upon with a three, three meter setback. Uh, the childcare space now moved to front on to the north side of the lane and along Kishigo Lane. Uh, the primary residential entrance is fronting Eastern Avenue. Uh, and then uh, as I mentioned before, the three meter setback and the recessed balconies. Uh, this is a section through the development 
uh, in the north-south direction. So on the left side, uh, we're looking at Queen Street uh, and then Eastern Avenue uh, to the right. Uh, and this really highlights the, what the building is doing in terms of setbacks to fit within that 45 uh, degree angular plane. And as I mentioned before, the 18th story has been added, but that's been set back and uh, the mechanical penthouse as well, uh, set back to be within the angular plane. And, and I'll hand it off to Stephen, uh, the, tra the traffic engineer. Thanks, Sonny. So since the previous community meeting, a transportation study has been completed and submitted to the city for review as part of the development application. Um, additionally, the design of the transportation of the element, transportation elements of the plan have also been uh, refined. Uh, access to the site will be provided through a new driveway to Eastern Avenue and a connection to Coxwell Avenue via the existing public laneway to the west of the site. Uh, access to the 81 parking spaces provided uh, underground uh, is through a ramp on the north end of the site from the internal site driveway. Uh, four pickup and drop off spaces are provided along the east side of the internal site driveway highlighted in yellow. Uh, there's a single loading space provided to serve the garbage and moving needs of the site. Um, as Chantal had mentioned, there's 280 bicycle parking spaces, uh, 252 are located on the ground floor and mezzanine for residents and 28 short term parking spaces for visitors are provided on the south face of the building uh, facing Eastern Avenue, uh, which is pointed to with the green arrow. Uh, a traffic analysis was also completed. Um, we expect that the this project will generate uh, 55 and 65 new vehicle trips in the morning and afternoon peak hours. Uh, that translates to approximately one additional vehicle trip per minute. Um, the analysis of the uh, traffic operations at the uh, intersections around the site have indicated that the impact will be minimal uh, and these intersections will continue to operate acceptably, uh, inclusive of the uh, traffic generated by other developments in the area. And with that, I'll pass it back to Chantal. Thanks, Steve. So following tonight's meeting, um, we will be, I'm oh, sorry, I'm actually just gonna quickly wrap up the overall project schedule quickly. So the final OPA and zoning bylaw amendment will be presented at the planning and housing committee at the end of September. And the market offering of the site will take place in October. Uh, at this point, we are estimating that construction could begin as early as Q2, 2023 and first occupancy would happen in Q2 2026. So following tonight's meeting, we'll be revising the plans to address the feedback that we received tonight. And after this meeting, we will be continuing our engagement activities with the residents of the adjacent TCHC building at 1080 Eastern Avenue and with Indigenous communities through our third Indigenous sharing meeting on, on June 29th. The, the staff report will be going to Planning and Housing Committee on September 21st and the statutory public meeting will take place at this, at this committee. The market offering to the development community will proceed in Q4 of this year. Before we open it up to discussion, we would just like to remind participants to sign up for project updates to continue to stay informed on the project as it progresses. And you can do that either on the Creatio website or by reaching out to Maladin, a community planner. And after tonight's meeting, you'll also be asked to fill out a post meeting form that will look similar to the, the sample that's shown on the, on the right hand side of the screen. I think that wraps up the presentation and now we'll be moving into the discussion portion. So I'll pass it over to Nicole. Wonderful. Thanks, Chantel, and thanks to all the presenters. Um, what we're going to do now is just promote the attendees um, from uh, attendees to uh, presenters as well. And um, Matthew, I may get you to just uh, unmute yourself or put your camera up for a second. Um, and make sure that I'm doing this properly. Matthew Wheatley. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna do it in just a second. For whatever reason. There we go. Everyone should be now 
and promote it. So I'm going to turn it back over. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay. I see a few hands up already. Um, I'm going to work from the top and I will leave it up to you um, uh, as participants. If you would like to um, turn your camera on or not, it's, uh, it's really up to you. And uh, we'll go with Scott and then Michael uh, and then Jan. So, uh, Scott, you want to go ahead? You should be able to unmute yourself. Um, if you have any issues, then let me. Uh, I, if I wait a minute and you're not yet unmuted, I will um, do it. My I'll do it for you. Scott, do you want to give it a try? There yeah. You Thanks, Nicole. Um, I'm going to just make a brief statement, then I'll end by asking you a question. And Nicole, if you could please keep my mic open until after the question has been answered. So if it isn't answered sufficiently, I can respectfully ask for some clarity. I hopefully, will work with you, no problem. Hopefully we can soon return to live in-person meetings and hope, hopefully in the future with a bit more than a week's notice, please. Go ahead, Scott. When the uh, legendary Jane Jacobs and other local residents opposed the Spadina Expressway and the Gardner Expressway projects because they wanted to preserve the character of their neighborhoods, nobody called them NIMBYs. They were called grassroots activists who wanted to preserve a city of neighborhoods. It appears that in today's world, Jane would be labeled a NIMBY if she stood in the way of an 18-story skyscraper proposal. I've certainly received that kind of abuse online. When the former Licks building on Queen Street was sold and a housing project was proposed for the site, the beach community was alarmed. The concern was that unless some rules were put in place, the unique character of the area would be lost. One merely has to look at Liberty Village on the west side to see what could happen. The beach's urban design guidelines were developed by citizens, good people working collaboratively with the then city councilor, Mary Margaret McMahon and city planners through a democratic process to prevent developers from building skyscrapers in our area. It took a lot of hard work by volunteers and by city staff and our counselor to finally work things out. But what emerged, known as the Beach Bible, has worked brilliantly for nine years to allow for growth while limiting the size of buildings to a human scale, an outcome that I dare say Jane Jacobs would applaud. Let me be clear. Nobody I know in the beach, and I've talked to hundreds of people, is opposed to affordable housing. This area has voted reliably progressive for over two decades in municipal, provincial, and federal elections. This neighborhood welcomes it, and we love the indigenous influences. The only issue on the table is the height of the proposed development at the site. And we're very disappointed that when we raised that height was a the problem that the response was to increase the height. That's very cheeky. Our concern is that if the city overrides the beach urban design guidelines, which have limited, which have limited developments to six stories, including setback requirements, that a dangerous precedent will be set. Developers will say that if the city thinks 18 story condos are good built form for this area, then they should be allowed to build them too. Everyone knows how that goes. The OMB has notoriously sided with developers in these situations. And the Beach Metro News has reported on many of those cases over the years. Recently, a condo development at 1630 Queen Street East, a former KFC restaurant lot was developed so that more people could enjoy the beach community. It's six stories, including setbacks, just like the Beach Bible calls for. And it's directly across the street from the proposed site for this 18-story skyscraper proposal. I'm sure that the developer at 1630 Queen Street would have loved to go higher to maximize profits if they'd been allowed. On the other side of Coxwell, in Paula Fletcher's ward, the city approved in the Queen and Ashbridge project, which also has high-rise buildings. I called the real estate agent who is tasked with selling the private condo units that are for sale in that development. She was eager to point out the, quote, high-end amenities, such as a steam room, a, sp a spin room, concierge, and of course, the stunning lake views. Not a word was uttered about affordable housing, but a two bedroom, two bath unit on the seventh floor could be mine for just over a million dollars. And guess what else she said? 
The higher up you went, the more stunning the views and the higher the cost to purchase. And I'd better act quickly, she warned, because the best units are selling fast. If you don't believe me, you can call her at 647-262-7803 if you wish to hear about the stunning lake views and the very expensive condos. Scott, you I hear your reading. Sorry, you I don't, I'm not going to stop you. Scott, just a minute. I'm not going to Scott you. I hear your reading. Do you have, how much more left do you have about? Two paragraphs. Okay. It's pretty clear why the development at 1631 Queen Street East is proposed at eight stories. The higher up you go, the more you can charge for stunning lake, lake views. However, we think the solution to this dilemma is obvious. The city owns the land. It can build a six story building and make it 100% affordable housing and everybody wins. In fact, we believe more affordable housing can be achieved with this approach. No variance is required. The city gets more housing units to help people languishing on a waiting list and the beach Bible is preserved. I think that's something Jane Jacobs would applaud. So to be clear, we agree with Brad that housing is needed. In fact, we insist that the city owned land be used for affordable housing. And we respectfully insist that the building conforms to the guidelines, just like every other project has had to do for nearly nine years. We're appealing to all the good people that work for the city planning department, the same good people who worked with us and our former city councilor to develop the beach Bible, to stand with us in support of it now. The intent of the guidelines are clear, to prevent skyscrapers and to have setbacks above three stories. Your proposal violates both those principles. If you've ever wondered why so many people don't bother to vote anymore, look no further than this type of cynical attempt. Don't set a bad precedent that can never be reversed. Tap into your inner Jane Jacobs, please. My question is, will Brad stand with the beach urban design guidelines and the volunteers who worked so hard to create it and build a Jane Jacobs scale building of six stories for affordable housing so we can welcome new neighbors to the beach? Please, Brad, be a hero, build the affordable housing, preserve the guidelines. That way, it's a win-win for everyone. Thank you, Scott. And um, I'm going to mute you quickly because I just want to make, and or with your agreement to not interrupt, because there's a few people who will very likely have to speak to that. So if you agree not to interrupt, I'm just not going to mute you. But can you just hold on? Because I'm sure that the counselor has something to say um, because you've directed it to him. But what I think you're touching on, um, I think the, the notion that there is another way to do this um, at 100% affordable at six stories is also very important for the team to address in terms of the finances um, and the economic realities that the city faces in terms of being able to deliver affordable housing. So I'm gonna turn it to a couple of people at least. Do you, I'm not going you're okay letting them go before I jump in um, so I won't touch your mic? Sure. Good. Councillor, you want to start and then Annalie and then Salima? Sure. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the comments, Scott. And, you know, I, I've read the stuff in the Beach Metro and I've seen the posters on the, on the hydro poles and, you know, the, the ocean of skyscrapers in the beach. Um, you know, when you opened up in, in the, um, uh, the speech there about Jane Jacobs, um, personally, I, I would just not conflate stopping a, an expressway that is going to bulldoze through ravine and neighborhoods with trying to stop uh, an affordable housing project. I just, I would not equate those as the same thing. Uh, you know, we want to talk about Jane Jacobs spent a lot of time in New York, New York, New York City. Uh, I'm sure you've read her books as have I. Uh, I, I actually disagree. Um, you know, Jane Jacobs would probably be very supportive of a, pro of a project that, you know, was bringing affordable units, allowing folks to live in different parts of the city. She was very big on that and providing more housing options for more people, which is what this is about. Um, with respect to the six stories and the notion that, you know, we could just build a six story building 100% affordable, uh, you know, perhaps, but, you know, a question that you would be interested in, how, how is that going to get paid for? Um, the whole premise of the housing now model, it's a cross subsidy model. That's how the model has been built uh, and created. That's how the performa works. So the market units cross subsidize the affordable units. So that is, that is the model that we're working with. It's, it's certainly, there are, there are places that do it differently. 
You could look at Austria, where nearly 3% of the national GDP goes towards building subsidized and affordable housing. Um, but that's not the context here in, in Canada. It's not the context in Toronto. So, so we do use a cross-subsidy model where market units pay for the, uh, the subsidization of affordable units. I will note that this is a leader in the Housing Now portfolio. When they first came out with this uh, in tranche one, they were 20%, 30% cross-subsidy. We are going to achieve 50% on this site, which is very significant. Staff will have an opportunity to talk about, you know, for 300 units total on this building, uh, they'd be able to talk about, you know, if they could achieve 150 units uh, of affordable in, in the six story. Um, lastly, I'll say we are now six stories on clean and, and that context, you know, the beach Bible, I, I don't call it that, but, uh, the beach urban design guidelines, uh, you know, it is very much in keeping with that six stories fronting on clean. Obviously we have a height density as it moves back, steps back. We heard from Aladdin on Eastern Avenue, which, which would be an Avenue designation. And it also fits within the angular plane. So this is on a transit line. We are in a housing crisis. I don't think Jane Jacobs would put her name in front of a project that was trying to, you know, stand in the way of, of building more housing opportunities for more people. Uh, I think an expressway through the heart of neighborhoods would be totally different, but your points are well taken. I hear you. You don't like the project. I support this project and I want to do it in a thoughtful and contextual way here in the neighborhood. I want to work with community builders who want to be a part of it and I want to see it get built. So hopefully that uh, provides some clarity on my position and I'll turn it over to staff to, uh, to follow up. Anna Lee or Salima, do you have anything to add to that um, with respect to the economics of making this work? I don't know if Anna Lee, you want to jump straight to Salima. Um, the counselor covered it perfectly and accurately. So I have uh, more to add to that. Thank you. Okay, so Scott, I've got 10 more people in the queue. Um, Councillor Fletcher, you want to jump in? Good. Thanks for the hand. I get that. Did you get my hand there? I yes, I did. It. It's perfect. Go okay. ahead. Uh, I just want to note for everybody that really and truly meeting the guidelines for Queen Street has been a goal all along Queen. So uh, that's coming to six stories, the revised plan actually meets those guidelines at riverside square i'm sure everybody knows where that is it's a big development down at queen and broadview that yeah, i insisted that the queen street flankage meet the guidelines of six stories and they do and the density is in behind and as well on don somerville again the queen street guidelines so that the street face the when you're on Queen Street, there is a consistent mid-rise um, facade all along and mid-rise housing. I also just want to correct you, um, Mr. Scott, I think it's Scott, isn't it? That on Don Somerville, that wasn't my ward until after 2018. It was actually the former councillor's ward, Councillor McMahon. That MOU had been signed uh, with her knowledge that that was exactly the same deal that you're looking at now, the 17 stories, the Queen Street flankage, that was all there. The only thing I did when I got elected was insisted and changed it, took me a year and a half to get 100 affordable housing units instead of, and 125 rentals instead of all condos after 600 some condos. So the condos are there, but there's now affordable rental and also regular rental along with the RGI redevelopment. So I think I just have to correct the record. It's it's not something that got dreamed up. That was there. And the planning staff supported that at that time in, the, in that configuration. But I think I'm very committed to making sure that that street face, you're on Queen Street, that it is that Queen Street model. Eastern Avenue is a major arterial road, very different than a residential zone, which is Queen Street residential commercial. So those are my comments. And sorry, Brad, I did, it's your side of the street, but I thought I better hop in because my side was mentioned. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna let you know um, that I've got 14 people. Um, Scott, uh, I'd like to get to them. Um, Michael, Jan, Karen, Larissa, Jeffrey, Susan, Luke, Bridget, Frank, James, Oliver, Housing Now TO, which is not the city, um, or Create TO, and then Uva. Um, so Scott, do you mind if I move to the next person then? Um, because I do think it's very important that we get through the queue. I kept my promise, Nicole. 
I think you should keep yours. I'm asking you, and I have not so, muted you. I, I would just like to say to Brad, it's a choice. You can talk about the intent. The intent was clear about paying for it. You guys find money for stuff all the time. I, let's just talk. You know how much over budget the Union Station project is. It's not about money. This is about making it a win-win for your constituents. We're all for the affordable housing. Just show respect to the rest of us. You can, you can be a hero, Brad. Just do the right thing. You know what the intent was. Scott, your message is clear. I'm gonna move on to the next person now. Do you mind muting yourself? Thank you. Great. Michael, you're up. Michael G. Yes, uh, thanks. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, I've been a resident of the area for 12 years now on the beach, and uh, I fully uh, support the affordable housing initiative it, and, and also the well-needed, you know, revised streetscape that this will bring the section of Queen. Um, you know, and in fact, that, you know, given it's publicly owned land, I, I also think that it should go 100% affordable. Um, but my concern is with the height of the building and also what the community has been told about the development. I mean, we just had now Councillor Fletcher say that, you know, guidelines are met all along Queen, but that Don Summersville is actually eight stories, if I recall, unless it's been revised on Queen. So even the front of that building doesn't meet. So it's just, we've seen developments not meet the guidelines all along Queen. But I have, I got two questions. Uh, the first is for the planners, you know, more technical. The other is for Councillor Bradford. Uh, so the first, um, the planners, you know, we we heard Councillor Bradford just earlier in this meeting say this is a trade-off between density and affordable housing. But the truth is the numbers for this development tell a different story. I mean, if we look at other buildings on Queen that have been built with a six-story form factor, the floor space index, 1249 Queen has been floor space of 4.4. Queen Woodbine, or what we call the old shell site, 4.7, you know, 759 Queen, 4.9. This 18-story building, 4.1. So this 18-story proposal doesn't hit the density of other six-story buildings along Queen. And my question to the planners is, why is the community being told that this height is essential for Queen? You know, can we not use the land between the TCHC building better? You know, why are we prioritizing vehicle access through this property and surface parking in a walkable neighborhood like the beach? And what is stopping us from building all 279 units in a six story form factor? So that's my question to the planners. Second one, and I'll let them answer, um, is towards Councillor Bradford. And I quote from his uh, newsletter, you know, I certainly wouldn't support 17 stories anywhere on Queen. It just doesn't work, especially east of Coxwell, especially east of Woodbine, end quote. So despite widespread opposition to the previous 17 story proposal, we now have 18 stories. So my question is, you know, I, I, I think the constituents need clarity as to what Councillor Bradford, with all respect, his opinion is on acceptable height east of Coxwell and east of Woodbine, you know, here's some examples, Murphy's Law of Redevelopment east of Coxwell, if they applied for 10 stories, would Councillor Bradford support that kind of height? The houses on the south side of Queen, I mean, uh, just east of Woodbine, many people would recognize, you know, the Victorian red brick uh, iconic house that just sold, same with the adjacent properties. These properties have a similar depth to this property. So this property is not unique and depth is used to justify additional height. So if there was an eight story proposal there, would Bradford support this east of Woodbine? So my, my, my question to Councillor Bradford is, um, you know, is the six story height or the, you know, what our previous councillor called the Beach Bible, uh, who endorsed him, uh, the thing of the past? And, or is this, you know, because I clearly see how this can set a precedent for other properties and this property is not unique. So thank you, Nicole. Uh, those are my questions. Great. Thanks We're going to get Anna Lee. Um, I'm going to ask on uh, the city and CreateTO side and elected officials to please be efficient with your responses. So it will help us get through um, more participants. And as soon as you're done, Jan, you're up next. Anna Lee, um, talk about the... Yeah. Um, FSI density, and then the counselor on how you're making your call on height. 
Okay, so thank you for the question, Michael. Um, I'm just going to say that the property does have limits and um, as Matthew showed at the beginning, the design for Gishigo Lane is very clearly um, something that is honoring Indigenous placekeeping, but also sits above some very significant underground infrastructure. So we are not going to build on that part of the property. With respect to the TCHC property that is not owned by the city, the TCHC owns its own land. And we have worked with TCHC to have an agreement to use a very, very small portion of its property so that we can make this site work and further um, take the height off of Queen Street and put it on to Eastern Avenue. Before I pass it over to Councillor Bradford, I just wanna point out something that Maladin was very clear on at the beginning of his presentation. And we heard people's concerns about precedent in the first meeting. And he was very clear that if you look at all the properties along Queen Street, this is the deepest property of them all. And further, it does not back on neighborhoods. Those sites that you mentioned on the north side of the street, they do. So if we were only to develop the south side of the property, for example, that would very clearly be an Eastern Avenue building. And from our perspective, the proposal that we're reviewing right now maintains six stories on Queen Street, and it's a very different frontage on Eastern Avenue as both Councillor Fletcher and Councillor Bradford pointed to. I don't know if that helps clarify those questions about land ownership and height. Uh, happy to follow up, but other than that, I'll pass it over to Brad. Yeah, thanks for the question, Michael, and thanks for the uh, thanks for reading the newsletter. Um, I uh, I know it's long and takes a long time to get through. No, so you know I, I'm consistent. This. Oh, counselor, we lost you. Am I back? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, I I was just gonna say um you know th this is six stories on Queen Street. Uh, it's consistent with the guidelines. And uh, and I view it the same way staff and uh, on Eastern. It's a through lot and, and that's where the density is. Eastern is not subject to the Queen Street guidelines. And so I see that uh, I see those as different things. You may not, um, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm trusting the professional opinion of the staff here. Uh, as I do on a lot of applications. So I know that you mentioned a lot of other sites and, uh, you know, generally speaking, I think the context really matters. Um, and, and I think Queen Street is the context, right? So the Queen Street context really matters. And when we're looking at subsequent applications coming forward, they need to be considered in the context. Uh, we have different guidelines and the guidelines speak to different sites at key intersections, whether you're talking Queen and Woodbine or, you know, Kingston and, and uh, Kingston and Queen or, um, different parts along the uh, the main street, so the context is important. But you know, context change, guidelines change, and um, you know we're we're trying to make it all work here. So I think that this is a sensible way to be able to deliver a significant number, 150 of affordable units here in a neighborhood that that really needs it. We are maintaining the intent of the guidelines with six six stories on Queen. That's literally what it is. We're staying within the angular plane and, uh, and, you know, the density is massed towards Eastern Avenue. So, um, so I support it. Okay, Jan, you're up and then I see Karen's hand has come down. So we'll go to Larissa, Jan. Hi, it's Jan. Can you hear me? Okay. Jan, sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. No problem. Um, okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, I've listened intently. So I'm actually opposed. Um, I, I don't think it's responsible development um, in view of the height of the building. Um, you've added a story, you've added a, a, a mechanical tower as well. We don't know the height of that, um, but I'm, I'm guessing it's a couple of stories. Um, I don't think that the plan amendments um, are justified. I think Maladin said it was 12 meters is the current plan on Eastern Avenue. And I, I do use that as a, you know, a rat way to get into the city. So I'm, I've always been looking at the height of buildings on Eastern Avenue and I'm conscious that. I think there aren't any buildings above uh, 6 stories. Uh, between Broadview and probably up to Maine and going beyond um, Kingston road. So, so this would be. You know, completely out of place. Um, it, it doesn't fit with the neighborhood in terms of the size of the building. I, I'm, I support, um, you know, 
the nature of the content of the building of the people that are going to be living there. However, um, I, I don't think that the site, I think the site is unusually shaped. I said this in the December meeting. I mean, it's obvious that uh, uh, buying out or keep getting the space that's taken by uh, the, the fast food outlet would make it easier to develop and perhaps um, lower. But uh, I'm glad somebody called it a tower. Uh, I'm not going to try and guess what Jane Jacobs would think. Um, uh, but those are my comments. So I don't think it's reasonable. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Jan. Thank you. Larissa. Uh, hi, yes, I'd like to also uh, oppose the project. Um, I think I, I'm in support of um, mixed housing or low income housing. Um, but I guess my biggest concern is uh, if you're marketing as anyone can buy it, um, all of the mixed housing units are going to be on the lower, uh, like six floors or so. And then the ones higher than that are going to be for sale at regular market price. So Again, you're ostracizing the people who are making less money and segregating them to lower floors. So I don't see how that's necessarily going to, I guess, in integrate everyone anyways. So, and I think the biggest um, selling feature of these is going to be the lakes front or lake view um, that they have going. So I just, I guess my question is, is how are you going to balance where people um, are going to have their low income uh, units versus ones that are for sale at market value? Got it. Uh, concern noted. Uh, Anne Lee, is that one for you? And then um, sure. next in the queue will be Jeff and then Susan. Jeffrey and then Susan. Sure. This is a 100% rental building. And there will not be two separate doors for people renting and owning. It will be a fully rental building and affordabilities will be mixed throughout the building. Okay, great. Jeffrey, over to you. Well, uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, I'm a resident uh, just north of Queen in the Beach Triangle area. And I think it's important to recognize that there are two separate issues here. The first one is what gets built at 1631 Queen. And We've heard a lot about that and clearly a lot of considerations go into this. But the second issue, which I think is discrete, whatever gets built at 1631, what precedent does this uh, set for further east along Queen Street? And I think in the interest of time, because people have talked about the first issue, I just want to um, acknowledge that Maladin made, I think, a pretty good start at uh, explaining uh, why the explaining why this probably wouldn't be, uh, or at least it could, it might not be a precedent uh, for um, for the rest of Queen. But I would just ask uh, two things. First of all, I guess maybe of of um, of uh, uh, Nicole um, in the meeting summary, um, what we had from Aladdin was his words plus one slide. If you could, uh, for this, and it's a little bit hard to remember and to evaluate what he said. If you could please take particular care to expand what he said so that instead of a brief summary of what the, 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 the precedent issue is, we actually have something that we can kind of sink our teeth in. And the one thing I can't remember from Aladdin, Aladdin, um, uh, whether or not uh, he uh, said that um, the 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 arguments that that he had he had advanced would uh, kind of limit the height generally, or if he was specific enough to say that would limit the height, his arguments would result in a limiting of the height to six stories. So that's uh, a request for the meeting notes. And secondly, um, I think it's important for posterity that assuming um, Muladin's um, uh, uh, or the 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 city's explanation ends up uh, convincing. I guess for the sake of posterity, it would really be helpful to see that in the 1631 Queen City Staff Planning Report, so that there's something on file where the city took a position that uh, we would hope the city itself would hold to to later. So um, those are my two uh, two questions. That uh, hope hopefully the answer. Would 
I, I saw you nodding, uh, Nicole, that hopefully the answer to that is yes. And, and I guess I just leave it with Brad that um, I think meeting minutes probably uh, of kind of hearsay what was said is, is different than something a report signed by the chief planner. So I, I would just throw that out for consideration. Those are both super clear um, and uh, we'll find a way to do it. Um, you said in the summary, the other thing is that we have these um, recordings transcribed so we could also attach the transcription, but um, a summary is a little easier. So I'll, uh, we'll endeavor um, Matthew and I to summarize and Laden can review and, and so sure. we'll have it in more than one place. And Great. you saw the thumbs up from Brad there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Susan, you're up next. I saw Luke has dropped his hand in the queue. So after Susan, we'll have Brigitte. Hi, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm not related to Councillor Fletcher, although we do share the same surname. I have several quick questions. They'll be yes or no or 10 word answers. Um, first is, are the 12 and 18 floor buildings separate or are they connected? And also the residential piece on Queen, is it like all connected throughout or are they actual separate buildings? Sony, you wanna, Sony, yeah, you wanna speak that. to I'm that? Glad, Cause I'm it's glad. hard to tell. Yeah, that, that's the, that was the whole idea was to make uh, make them three separate buildings and not one uh, giant monstrosity of buildings. So yeah, they're, they're actually one building. Uh, there's one entry point along Eastern Avenue uh, serving the, you know, the elevator core and uh, corridors connecting all those units. Thank you. Um, I love the look of the Kashigo Lane. I'm just wondering how snow clearing would work on it. So through to maintenance, Matthew, um, do you want to jump on that or somebody from the city in the um, Matthew from Turo or somebody from the city thinking ahead to maintenance? I think Matthew, Matthew Hickey got bumped out of the meeting. So I'm just trying to get him back in at the moment, but I can speak okay. quickly to maintenance. So that would ultimately be worked out, I think, through the project agreement and would be the responsibility of the proponent to ensure that the Kishiba lane is maintained and snow cleared. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm really impressed that there'd be two and three bedroom units, so they'd be family friendly. Um, what school would children attend and how full were those schools in 2019-20, acknowledging that COVID might affect current enrollment? And you probably don't actually have the current enrollments at your fingertips. What are you thinking from school, the impacts on schools, you guys? Um, Lana, you take this one. Sure. The the schools have been circulated the application when it came in a couple of weeks ago, so they are aware of the application and the future sort of um, number of residents moving into the area, you know, so they can keep that in their sort of file and make considerations in the future based on the population growth in the area. Thank you. And my final question is um, the large parking lot on the south side of Eastern. I assume that that's city owned land and I just wondered if the city was thinking, hey, there's another place for um, housing now development. That's not currently uh, in any housing now plans at all. Thanks very much. That's all for me. Okay. Thanks, Susan. Um, I had, uh, I thought I was missing Luke, but I see him. Um, and uh, so Luke, do you want to go ahead? Um, unmute yourself and, and ask your question. After Luke, I have Brigitte. Hi, I'm on Brad's housing now call. Oh my God, it's pretty brutal. <laughs> Counselor, you're um, not muted. Uh, so uh, Luke, do you wanna go ahead? I'm gonna unmute you if you can't do that on your own. We'll give it a try, here we go. Luke. Hi there, yeah. Hi. All right, we're able to hear me now. Sorry, it seems yes. I was bumped off. No uh, I just wanted to really quickly uh, speak in favor of the, the proposal. I, I guess, uh, based on what I've heard here, the key argument against the proposal rests on uh, the height restrictions uh, that have been applied to market rate housing in the UDG. Uh, it's pretty clear that a compromise has been struck without sacrificing this uh, existing UDG. Um, it's a height restriction of, of six stories applied to a major traffic artery and streetcar route. Uh, in the fourth largest city in North America. So uh, the fact that the compromise was made in the first place, uh, I think is impressive. Uh, and thankfully the, the 17 story building itself is not on Queen, uh, it's on Eastern Avenue. Um, so I think what it comes down to is sort of a, a fundamental question of values. Uh, do we value our desire not, not to have or, or live near certain tall buildings uh, over the needs 
of the working class in this city uh, to be housed in the midst of a housing crisis? Uh, and the answer to that, I think, should be obvious. Um, also worth pointing out, this is not about market rate housing. Uh, it's about affordable housing on city owned land. Uh, so that kind of begs another question, uh, which is, do we value the height restriction uh, over the city's duty to use public assets effectively? Uh, and I'm, I'm a young guy and I never thought I'd, I'd start a sentence with as a taxpayer, but um, as a taxpayer, uh, the idea that city owned land uh, would be used so inefficiently as to be anything less than 18 stories uh, under this particular financing system is, is uh, frankly pretty appalling. So uh, I, I don't think that could be justified to the rest of the residents of the city, uh, particularly when there are 17 housing now proposals spread out all over the city. Uh, when it's a shared responsibility, it isn't right for residents in one neighborhood to try and opt out of it uh, when everyone else is being asked to do their share. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping we can think like a city for once, and I'm, I'm hoping this is an opportunity uh, for the beach to, to lead in that respect. Uh, I know the neighborhood votes progressive. It has a great track record. Uh, I, I just hope that that's reflected uh, in its support for this, uh, this proposal. I promise you, I promise you, if you do, uh, you're going to find that the neighborhood uh, it becomes more dynamic, uh, it becomes more diverse, uh, better reflective uh, of the city as a whole, and, and overall a better place to live uh, for everyone. So please, if we're going to delay this any further, do it in the interest of adding more units, not less. Uh, I think that a great compromise has been struck. Uh, I love Kishigo Lane. I, I think that's going to be a wonderful uh, addition to the community as a whole. Uh, so, so please uh, expedite the process, if anything. Uh, there, there's a desperate crisis. For housing. Got it, Luke. Uh, thank you, uh, Brigitte. And then um, I realize we also have a call-in user, so we'll go to Brigitte, uh, and then the call-in user, and then I'll go to Frank. I've got Frank, James, Oliver, Housing Now, Tio, Uva, John, Rebecca, Gregory, and Courtney. I promise you will not get to you all in the next fourteen minutes. Sorry. So the quicker Nicole, we can get this, the better. I think that Councillor Bradford was dropped from the call. Yeah, and I have a note that he's coming back. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So, Bridget. Hello. Um, yes, my name is Bridget Seaver. I'm a beach resident and I am in support of the Housing Now program. However, I do have some concerns and I do realize there are sensitivities on all sides. So, I would like you to hear me out. I've heard Mladen speak to um, Eastern as the rear and the back of the site at a different meeting from this one. And yes, Eastern is currently different characteristically from Queen, but Eastern is respectfully um, transforming rapidly from a vehicular artery to a community street. And this site, 1631, fronts Woodbine Park as well. And so my interest is how are we envisaging Eastern as a street that was not included in the urban design guidelines. We've got some feedback. I'll just make sure it looks like um, I'm just going to mute somebody here. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so I just, I just would like to understand how we're thinking, how planning, how city planning is thinking of Eastern. I feel like it's an orphan at the moment. Um, and absolutely, it is a fast paced artery at present. And I would like to simply suggest that the mid rise guidelines recognize different widths of streets as drivers of height. So, height along Eastern, because Eastern is wider than Queen, would be higher. And it could be potentially as high as 11 stories. I don't actually know the width of Eastern Avenue. Um, which would still be a mid rise. 18 stories is a high rise and it's got two stories of penthouse. Well, the equivalent of two stories of penthouse stacked up against Eastern Avenue. And I tend to agree that it's a dangerous precedent. And I actually think that it, I'm not against height but, and in, but I do worry about a 17 story building fronting Eastern Avenue. And when I think about um, Jane Jacobs, I think that she probably wouldn't have any concerns about having something that's still within the mid rise range based on the width of Eastern Avenue. But I do think that she would 
challenge something that's 17 stories high. Um, I really appreciated Sunny Ray's comment about reimagining Eastern. I realize that there's a mandate that housing now has, and we are trying to get as much affordable housing on this particular site. But I also feel strongly that we need to take care of our urban development and not just have one driver drive the bus in terms of the solution. And so I would suggest that, um, and I would like to ask, is there, it does planning have a visioning study or a study for development along Eastern Avenue? And has that been made public at the Thanks, moment? Thanks, um, yes, that's we'll it. go to the call in user after, but um, somebody from planning, Annalie or Maladin, you want to take what's your what's the city planning thinking well, on? Sure. I, I just want to clear up, you know, the first meeting was a meeting when we were really at the very beginning of the design. So we heard a lot at that first meeting and I hope and you, you did acknowledge that you've seen some changes from it. Um, now we have a knowledge that there'll be a front door on Eastern Avenue, that the tower will be entrance, entered from Eastern Avenue. And there's also um, a new street section for Eastern Avenue, which was included in the first uh, in the first public meeting. And for brevity, we've kind of de-emphasized de some of the de deep, deep detail. But I mean, we can speak to that section. Um, Audrey is here and she is the landscape architect and she can speak to it. But we are looking at a cycle track, a cycle lane, double row of trees, and a generous public realm on Eastern. It will be one of the first developments to build that out. I think she's asking about what you're thinking about the heights along Eastern, just generally, not just this building. Like, what's the vision of city planning for Eastern in general? There, there's no design guidelines specifically speaking to Eastern Avenue. A lot of our um, sort of urban design approach would be to make sure that there's the limit or the impact along Queen Street is mitigated or limited, but also East Avenue is sort of a mismatch of different types of lot sizes. Not every single lot is going to be able to accommodate um, 11 story building or 16 story building. There's also a lot of different non residential uses along Eastern Avenue, such as the water treatment plant, uh, the park, the TPA lot. So it's not going to develop overnight. Um, and if it is, uh, we're going to take the approach that we want to limit the impact along Queen Street. Okay, Mladen, thanks a lot. Um, we've got uh, nine minutes left and I'm going to go to the call-in user. Um, go ahead and unmute yourself or I can do that for you actually now. And then after that, I'll go to Frank James Oliver. Call-in user, you're on. Hi, um, I'm Leanne and uh, I live at 1080 Eastern Avenue, um, right beside um, this 18-story tower that they're putting up. I'm not in favor of it. Um, I don't think it uh, uh, looks very aesthetically pleasing for the area. It's, it's just simply too high. I'm also worried about the impact it's going to have on our building by having a driveway and an underground parking lot coming through the, uh, the side of our building, which would be the west side of um, 1631 Eastern Avenue. Um, and also the pick up and drop off uh, area. I think we're going to have, uh, you know, a higher rate of carbon in the area. This driveway we have coming through here is, uh, it's not big enough for uh, the amount of traffic that's going to come through. People are going to come through here shopping, picking up their children from daycare and uh, unloading, you know, um, parcels. Also, I'm a little taken back by um, Matthew Wheatley when he said that, um, you know, they want to build um, a community garden on Kashingo. Fine. We also have this TCH building has a community garden out back here, and I use that along with a few other tenants. And it's ironic that our garden will be taken away in support of putting one on Kashingo. Okay. That's all I have Thanks. to say. Thank you. Thanks, Leanne. And I think you meant Matthew Hickey from Two Row. Um, and um, I don't know if anybody from the city or the consultant team is um, it wants to respond to anything that was said, or else I'll just keep working. Through yeah, the, Nicole, can I, can I just speak to that quickly? So, mm -hmm. um, hi, Leanne. Thank you for the comment. We're going to be having a, a second tenant meeting with, with 
the tenants from your building on June 23rd. So the flyers should have been posted up this morning or yesterday in the building. And the proposed landscape improvements that were shown on the landscaping plan that Audrey shared earlier, they have enough space to accommodate um, some community gardens. So we'll be speaking in much more detail about that at the tenant meeting, but I, I want to assure you that we did hear the feedback that, that was shared at the last tenant meeting, and that's being reflected in the, in the landscape plans. Okay. Thanks, Chantel. Okay, well, um, can... Her point was you're taking away hers and give it back. They're going to have an update meeting um, to get into more detail about exactly how it works. Um, but yeah, the point is taken that do you have to, are you taking away from one in order to create the other? Um, maybe just addressing that bluntly would be would be helpful. Mm -hmm. And and the other thing too is the reason why I don't uh, I'm not in favor of the height of the building is because well in part it it just doesn't look natural to this this area here on on Eastern Avenue. Uh, I don't think uh, as I'm going up and down Eastern Avenue I do that quite frequently and um, I don't see any high buildings you know they're all pretty much the like lower than uh, this here building here. So, yeah, we got uh, you. And we, interesting because they had their gloss. We got you. Know, you man. I was just gonna jump in and ask Craig hey. Toyota specifically, awesome. just be clear on whether there's green space being taken away from the TCHC building in order to um, make Keisha Go Lane. Sort of a, a yes no would would be great. Okay, so yeah. yes, okay. yes, we will be taking away green space from 1080 Eastern Avenue, and that would impact their existing community garden. But we are proposing to replace that community garden in the landscape improvements that were shown on the site on the 1080 Eastern Avenue portion. Okay, Chantel, thank you. I'm what I've got is um, still quite a long uh, speakers list, and at the suggestion of the city and Creatio. We're going to extend the meeting for 45 at 45 till 845. Um, so we're going to go until 845. And with that, um, I'm going to folks that have been super patient. Frank, James and Oliver uh, are up next and then housing now to um, and uh, I'll just keep working through the list while we still have time. Okay, thank you. I'm not You're welcome. Sure no problem, I think they're going to be in the 18 story building. I'm, I've got Frank next in the queue. So um, if you're not Frank, do you mind just muting yourself and we'll go to Frank who's been quite patient. Can you hear me? Yeah, Frank, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say that I'm, I'm generally not in favor of this proposal as it's currently uh, laid out. Uh, okay. I fully support what Scott said at the start that there are ways and means to make this work for the affordable housing component uh, at a hundred percent, I think. I think he's quite correct to point out this is a money issue. This isn't a land use issue. This is a money issue. And that uh Craig Teo and the planning department needs to focus on on the result, which is the, the units here. Uh, several good comments were made about uh, Maybe expanding the site by taking over the uh, Harvey's location. I think that is something to be explored deeply. But one thing that's overriding in my mind, I, I'm a numbers guy. That's my that's my field. I've seen no pro formas. No pro formas have been shared about how this, you know, uh, proponent uh, aspect actually works. Uh, so we're working with you know a wish sandwich in a sense that you know if we had known what the map is here if you will there's more room to see the possibilities we've been given you know sort of a a, a fixed menu if you will and that's what the city's working off and i think that's that's not quite uh, what should be done here i think we, we you know put some creativity into create to essentially let's look at doing it to respect the, the design guidelines for the, for the area. Because uh, honestly, CREATO and, and the planning department, you're coming off as hypocrites. I'll be blunt here. If you are sincere and genuine about what should be done with Eastern Avenue, then sell off that portion of the property and deal with Queen Street as a separate matter. And I'm sure, given the value of the property, if the 18 stories were to be permitted or allowed in any of them, or anything over six or eight stories, that there's more than enough money to be generated from the sale of that portion of the property 
uh, the fully fun, you know, affordable housing complex, fronting queen. And truth be told, this is a two-headed monster. Uh, Eastern Avenue and, and the depth of this lot is, is unique in that regard. But what's missing here, I'm finding, is, is the, the lateral thinking. Uh, okay. That we should parse this parcel, essentially. Okay, so what you're suggesting is guidelines. breaking it into two pieces and allowing additional height on Eastern and using that revenue to invest in affordable housing on Queen, if yes, I understand exactly, well, Frank. Yes, that, that has Good. to be examined without numbers, you know, to see whether that works. I mean, obviously, the mix of units could aff affect the costing, uh, but, you know, we don't know enough because that's not been shared. And I don't know, frankly, that that's been examined in depth uh, on the, the CREATL side. Certainly nothing has been shared with us. Uh, okay, well, I've got it as a piece of advice um, yeah. uh, for them to go ahead. I don't know if anybody from the CREATL or city team wants to jump in or we'll just keep rolling. No, Frank, I th thank you very much, first of all, for your patience, because I know there's many people that are in the queue. Um, and I think I've, we've got that point loud and clear. Thank you. Thanks, James, and then Oliver, and then housing uh, now TO, the uh, the the the, the uh, community organization. James. Hi there. My name is James Gray, and I'm a 30-something that has moved into the area in the past 12 months. I'm about 400 meters from the project site on the Ward 14 side of the road, and I would like to express my strong support of this development. I'm very privileged to have grown up in Toronto and uh, have been able to move into this neighborhood with my partner. We need affordable housing to keep this city working, and there is definitely capacity in this neighborhood to support this development. I do think this development will be a landmark, uh, and I support any effort to embolden the design to allow for more affordable units. I think Kishigo Lane in particular is a fantastic design concept, and I would love to see spillover of its concept and its art design blending into Woodbine Park. If there is any further ability to augment bike parking, that would be very welcomed as there are very few uh, ring and posts along that stretch of Queen. Thank you for the opportunity to support uh, this project. Okay, thanks, James. Oliver, thanks for your patience. Hi, thank you. Um, I'd just like to follow up with James to say I'm fully in support of this project. Uh, any affordable housing as much as possible as needed is great. Land is finite. We only have so many city owned lots in the city. And so each spot should be maximized for as amount as housing as possible. When you're six kilometers from Young Street, uh, you need to put people there because if you don't build tall that close to the downtown core, then where else would you build? Especially along the Queen's, Queenie Streetcar route, which is a great route. It's a very busy route. I use that a lot as well to get around the city in the East End. And it's a bit uh, difficult to try uh, to live as a young person in the city when the average house being sold. Uh, and the beaches goes for about 1.4 million. So these houses are a huge affordability bonus. And that's the only way that people like me can stay in the city who work uh, and try and live. Um, and, you know, this tall building has great amenities on it. The design is excellent. And I think that, you know, the only regret is that it's not taller. It, uh, and I hope that we can build more units along like this in the beaches neighborhood because the beaches is a great neighborhood. Uh, I wish to join it. I'm just on the edge of it because that's all I can afford. Uh, and I think it's a bit rich that people are trying to prevent more people from joining this neighborhood. Thank you. Okay, next, Housing Now TO. And just to be clear, um, housingnowto.com is a um, not affiliated with the City of Toronto or Create TO. And I'll leave it to Housing Now TO to describe their own, uh, their own work. Go ahead, Housing Now TO. Hey, how are you? Uh, so yeah, we're a volunteer organization. Uh, I'm Mark Richardson. I'm the technical lead with Housing Now TO. We track all the affordable housing developments that are going on around the city. I am also a 20 year resident of the East End. Uh, both of my kids were baptized in uh, a church on Queen Street, not far away from this site. Uh, so hopefully that makes me beachy enough for the folks who've been waving around their beach Bible this evening. Um, we have a choice to make in this neighborhood. I am 100% supportive of this development. Um, when we were talking about this development back in the fall, I was more interested in seeing extra floors on the Queen Street side than I was in losing height on the Queen Street side. 
because the more we exploit the full floor plate, the more units we get. Uh, you know, there's 23 to 28 units per floor in the first six floors of the building. By the time we get to the tower, we're down to 12 units per floor. Uh, and it makes it hard to do the family size units and the accessible units and the two and three bedroom units. Um, you know, it's great for people to say, I support affordable housing, but, uh, you know, I vote reliably progressive, but there is no but here. Uh, the math is the math on these sites. Uh, my question specifically, just to give this site some context, is for Create TO or City Planning. There is another Housing Now site that is in the Cabbage Town Heritage Conservation District that is next door to Victorian houses. Could the staff please tell us how tall that Sherburn Street site is for Housing Now? That's my only question. Thank you. Uh, yes, that is a 26 story building. Okay, thank you. Um, Karen, uh, I had you in my queue way back when in number four, uh, you must have been bumped and came back. So I'm going to go uh, Karen and then I've got Uva, John, Rebecca, Gregory, Courtney, uh, Mary, Vanessa and Brian. We'll see how many people we get through in the next 10 minutes. Um, Karen, go ahead. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I just have a quick question. How many accessible units are there avail that will be available? Great, quick answer. 20% of the affordable units will be accessible and then 15% of the, of the market units will be accessible. I don't have the actual math on that in front of me. Well, we could do the math. It's 200 and something units, right? Yeah, yeah. but it okay. depends on the affordability units. Okay, so it's a, we've got a percentage right now, Karen. Do you need the number? And if so, can we go to the next person and then we'll come back? Yeah, a number would be nice. You can come back to me afterwards. Okay, great. Maybe we can Thank do a you. quick calculation and we'll come back to you. Uva, you're next. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, no problem. Um, I'm Uva Semro. I'm uh, the past president of the uh, Beach and East Toronto Historical Society. And I'm speaking on behalf of the board. Um, and I would like to do three things, express the concerns that the board has uh, on this project, make a personal observation and, and, and lastly, ask a question. Right. So the first thing is uh, the, the concern of the board um, relates to the potential precedent of this development has on future redevelopment of Queen Street East. And I'd like to define specifically what kind of precedent we are concerned about. We're not concerned about the height precedent. Um, the precedent that the board is concerned about is the fact that to accommodate this structure, um, it needs to be exempt from the Queen Street East uh, Urban Design Guidelines because uh, even after I recalculate the uh, presentation tonight, it appears that it will be eight stories in the building on along Queen Street that falls within the area of the urban design guidelines. So in order to do that six and eight story building, the, the application has to somehow exclude it from the urban design guidelines. And therefore, it precedent is if the city can um, conduct a development by excluding it from the urban design guidelines, private developers will say the same thing. We have a proposal and we would like it to, uh, for a site specific um, official plan and zoning amendment excluded from the um, urban design guidelines. So height is height precedent is not the issue. It's the process precedent. The, the, the process precedent of, of allowing exclusion uh, development along Queen Street East and only uh, that are subject to the urban design guidelines. Understood. And, 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 and that is really the main concern. It will impact uh, the way development will be applied for in the future. And I guess uh, I have some notes here and I'm gonna go to the bottom. So the board 
kind of feel strongly that the city must demonstrate how it would defend against applications to LPAT um, at, at LPAT hearings using precedent as a rationale that if the city can do this, we can do it as well. And, and the application is not for six stories, it might be for seven or eight, but we want to be excluded from those guidelines. And that's that's the main concern. Um, Understood. Currently, the, the guidelines are uh, allowing uh, uh, the regional main street character to be used to, to keep the main street character of Queen Street. And private Understood. development has not been kind to affordable housing in along Queen Street East. Um, it's, it's actually been quite evident that, that the recent condo developments along Queen Street have caused a uh, loss of affordable rental housing by removing overstore re rental apartments. And, um, and potentially this could go to uh, the, the, walk -up, the older walk-up uh, apartments that are uh, along Queen Street is that have also have heritage uh, assets as well. So I think it's, it's more of a concern about process and, and the city needing to be able to do that. My personal observation, um, is more of a nature that this issue um, has kind of created a, uh, a con split in the community where um, on the one side you have people who uh, insist that increased height and density is, is necessary to achieve affo affordable housing. And on the other side, you have NIMBYs who, because they oppose appropriate height uh, and density uh, or inappropriate height and density, are accused of being uh, against affordable housing. And in my view, this, this division in the community is really not necessarily in, necessary and, dis, and destructive. It is absolutely false notion that extra height and density brings about affordable housing. If that were the case, downtown core would be awash in affordable housing. Until the city passes inclusionary zoning policy, the market sector approach will continue to drive affordability further and further away from urban centers. And it's it, it's a necessary step that the, the city needs to take, but the, the structure, the system that got us into this problem still exists and is still continuing to worsen the, the situation. So the city absolutely needs to work on inclusionary zoning uh, to make affordable housing necessary as part of major urban redevelopment. And that's the only way to see solve the long-term uh, problem of this. So we support this, but I think the city needs to actually do more in a planning sense than just um, sort of do these interim public supported housing projects. I think it needs to be part of the private sector responsibility as well. And the last thing is, I have a question. The uh, Housing Now um, Phase 2 report indicated a target of 100 affordable units for this uh, site. Um, and we're now at, I think, uh, 139. And I I'm just curious as what was the need to increase the, the target to 139? Um, to to uh, to build this uh, facility, I, I, I think a hundred units. If that was the target, then then perhaps the the uh, mass of the building could be reduced. I I don't know why it needed to be increased to one hundred and thirty nine beyond the target. Okay, that's a clear question. Um, Creatio or the city want to speak to the increase in the number of affordable units, the target there, and then. After that, Chantel, I'll ask you, do you have to jump in with the number on the um, on the number of accessible units? And then after that, I'm going to hand it over to Councillor Bradford. Um, we said we would extend the meeting by 15 minutes. We unfortunately will not get to everybody in the queue, but I know he wants to give some closing remarks. And uh, we will make sure uh, that you all have um, Laudan's email address as well as contact information for the um, others who you may want to contact. So let's go first on the who's the best to speak to the increase in the number of affordable units from 100 to 139? Chantel. Okay. Chantel, please. Great. 
the, the target of 139 is based on a 50% target of affordability. The minimum requirement would be one third of all of the units be affordable rental. So I think that's where the disconnect is coming from in the report. So the, the 100 is the one third um, as the minimum and the 139 is fit the target, which is 50%. Correct. Okay, great. Do you have a num the number on the number of accessible units just for Karen before we hand it over to Council Bradford? Yes, yeah, so similarly, based on a 50% target of affordable units, 28 of those would be affordable accessible units, and then 21 of those would be affordable market units. I'm sorry, accessible market units. Okay, so 49 in total. Correct. Great. Uh, okay. N N Nicole, Nicole, I, I don't want to argue about this, but I think the, the phase two report did say uh, 200 affordable units with 50% at 100. So I, I, I still don't know where it got increased. Uh, Uwe, I'll just, I'll just jump in. When we go, when we went forward with the phase two report, um, we also considered the potential of having um, ownership units on the site. So it's actually fantastic news that we are targeting a 100% rental building. And as such, the ratios changed. But um, in fact, one thing that's come is that um, the building is um, been refined to meet the guidelines that we've been discussing, the ones that I know are uh, uh, up for debate here but we've been trying to work within that angular plane to create an, a building that has enough units that can make this work um, and support a significant number of new affordable rental units. Okay, thanks, Annalie. I'm gonna turn it to Councillor Bradford. And um, what I'd like to say just in wrapping up is we will write up a summary from today. Um, and we know that there will be many outstanding questions and comments. We will make sure you get um, the contact information of the appropriate people to be able to ask those questions too. As facilitators of many public processes, um, it's clear that uh, what we have is the burden of trying to find common ground among multiple points of view. And there are choices and consequences with those choices. And I think we've heard people both supportive and against um, uh, the um, the uh, development here. And I think the councillors and the um, staff from Create TO and the city have been um, have been hearing all of that. Uh, so we will uh, we will write that up. And um, it is this kind of healthy public participation that makes our city work. So. Um, Councillor uh, Bradford, over to you for some last remarks, and then we will be wrapping up for now. Great, uh, and I apologize for the technical difficulties. My WebEx crashed, uh, my Skype crashed, I'm trying to get the computer back on. So I'm sorry, I will watch the tape, and uh, I know my team's on the line taking notes, and we'll get the summary from uh, from our consultants. But thanks for everyone for being on the line and we still have a lot of folks with us uh i think that's that's very good it's very help, healthy we've had a lot of great feedback tonight um you know reflecting on where we were uh with our first meeting last year uh we've seen a significant evolution from what we heard in that meeting um you know many of you were there but if, if you've been following uh we we have the rev, rev, resolution of six stories on on queen now uh, there's been tremendous project uh progress on kishigo lane um the work on building a brand new child care uh center here um i think uh, the fact that we're gonna have a 100 rental building um, something that we didn't talk about uh, was all of the environmental standards uh, above the building code that we're going to be realizing here, which I know is very important for our community. Um, so I'd encourage you to keep giving us your detailed feedback um, and suggestions because it really helps. Um, UA's comments right there at the end that I caught about inclusionary zoning. Uh, you, the city has been doing work on that for years. Uh, we had a change in the provincial government in 2018, as, as most of us are aware of, um, and they actually rolled back the progress on inclusionary zoning. They, they changed it, and, uh, and as a result, the city has had to um, revise its position with the new provincial framework around inclusionary zoning, or IZ. UA is absolutely right. We need to get that. We need to push for as, as much inclusionary zoning in these projects as possible. Um, until we have the regs and the permissions from the province, we're not able to do that, but it's very top of mind. It's something that our city planning staff have been working on uh, for many years under the old uh, regulations and, and since going forward under the new ones. And you're absolutely right. Like on market buildings, um, that's what we're gonna need in order to preserve affordability in our city, which is ultimately about 
livability and sustainability, places for your kids, places for your uh, your parents, uh, places for Torontonians, because this city and particularly our part of town is there's such an affordability crisis. So I think also you always comments there at the end, uh, just about the divisiveness, uh, you know, the way that this thing gets torqued. Uh, do you want affordable housing or not? Uh, are you okay with density? Are we building skyscrapers? You know, it's going to be okay. We're going to be okay. We're going to go through this. We're going to work on it together. There are going to be different views. Uh, people are passionate. Uh, some folks will be angry on, on both sides of this discussion, but we will get through it. Uh, we are going to have a fantastic project here. It really is going to be something special. And I think that at the end of it, something that we're all going to feel good about and something that we can be proud of. So um, the last thing I, I would say is uh, Jeff's comments about the precedent piece. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for raising that. Uh, it's very good advice for, for staff and for all of us to hear. We do need to be thoughtful of that. Uh, and we can do what we can to capture that feedback as Nicole mentioned as well. So uh, the precedent piece, uh, respecting the six story guidelines on, on Queen, uh, it's it's something that's top of mind for staff. It's been reiterated by, uh, you know, certainly half of the comments here tonight and in the hundreds of pieces of correspondence. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, we have to build housing for people. Um, that's what we're doing here. And I'm glad that you are all a part of that, um, regardless of where you are on this project. We're a part of a conversation that's that's bigger than our community. It's a conversation here in Toronto. And uh, it's something that we're gonna need to address if we want this city to be sustainable going forward. So I will leave it there and I'm looking forward to working with everybody uh, in the weeks and, and months ahead. Good night, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Good night. Good night.